My name is Bill Martin. And uh, what do you do? I'm a professor for molecular evolution at the University of Dusseldorf. All right. And are we alone in the universe? Depends on who you would count as a neighbor or as a, as a we. Okay. Um, what do you, the, the, when the, I asked you the question, what did you understand by the word we? Well, I've heard this question before. Some people think intelligent life, somebody we could talk to, somebody that would fly a spaceship. Uh -huh. And other people think uh, some, any form of life in general, right? carbon-based life, things that are alive and growing. And I would say that the, if you ask me, I'd say the chances that we have life, that is microbes, somewhere else in the universe is almost certain, and the chance that we have intelligent life is probably pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, why do you say that? There's something, I think it's called the Drake Equation. Mm -hmm. It gives some probability. It just, it's a numbers game. There are just so many planets and so many stars and so much right. material in the universe that regardless of how improbable the event, the sequence of events might seem that lead to intelligent life, it was possible on Earth. That we have proof, right? We have evidence that it is possible. And if it's possible here, it's possible somewhere else. And then, okay, now how about the, you and I are speaking the English language here. Right. We can study the origin of the English language. It's possible here, but very few people would think that any alien would speak English. They're thinking so clearly. They they are thinking clearly. It's very <laughs> unlikely. So that there's a they, they, it's very <laughs> unlikely that it's in the movies they come out and can right. speak English. But okay. there's a what I'm <laughs> saying is that's a counterexample to the idea of if it happened here, it should or could happen somewhere else. Well, you've got a point there, but um, the verbalization. Okay, we've got intelligent life here on this planet. Uh, and I don't know how many different languages we have among humans. Just one language. I don't know, maybe a hundred, maybe more basic languages. And that indicates to me that this is, um, that the, once one has intelligence, that the, uh, the probability to, uh, of, of finding, or the, um, the, uh, threshold of evolving a language is very low, and that means that the chances that you'll get the same one twice are very low. In any case, the, your answer to the question, are we alone, independent of what we is, whether it's we intelligent or we life forms, is no, we're not alone. I think so. And that's because life, you think life evolves on any Earth-like planet, or why? Uh, it doesn't even have to be a planet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this year has seen a lot of uh, interesting discoveries. Last year, there's a there was a moon around in uh, Saturn called Enceladus, and they found process uh, evidence for a process called serpentinization taking place on that moon. Serpentinization is a geochemical process that generates molecular hydrogen, which is a source of chemical energy. And this year, uh, Frank Postberg and his colleagues reported some of the results from the Cassini mission showing that there's organics in mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And the, the paper last year in Science also indicated that there are, there's probably the synthesis of very simple organic compounds. Uh, but everybody agrees that going on there's lots and lots of there. Earths, lots and lots of water, and lots and lots of the ingredients for life, right? But very few people agree on with whether you can go from the ingredients to recipe to produce life. Well, my my point was simply that we've got the example of Earth, and then we've got the example of Enceladus, two bodies in this solar system that we've sampled, and both are uh, that the, the, uh, have liquid water, and they're generating reduced organic compounds in geochemical processes. Mm -hmm. now, you're talking right. to someone right. who is a strong proponent of the idea that life arose at hydrothermal vents through reactions of molecular hydrogen generated by serpentinization with carbon dioxide from the ancient oceans. 
and therefore the findings that we see similar processes going on in hydrothermal vents today, on Enceladus around Saturn, and on very certainly on the early Earth indicates that with, even with this small sample size, we see the same chemistry going on even uh, on other bodies within our solar system. And what the icy moons and these processes on, uh, going on on Enceladus, they, they expand the habitable zone way beyond what we call the Goldilocks zone, just so right you, around the sun. Because so these moons on these giant gas planets, they have the potential to, have, to generate the same kind of chemistry as we see here. And that, in principle, would increase the chances of seeing life on other bodies enormously. Okay. Um, in the question, are we alone, what does the word alone mean? <laughs> I would have focused more on we. We did. Uh, we, just talked about, we just talked about we. Now we're talking about alone. Uh, no, no. For example, if I were not in this room, would you be alone? No, because you'd be somewhere else. No, no. Would you be alone? <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be close enough so you're not alone. Okay. So that's why you asked. It depends on how far away you mean. How far away do you have to be? How, how far we are physically, okay. how far we are phylogenetically or chemically. I would, of course, not be alone because I've got about... 10 to the 13th microbes in my body, 10 to the 14th, okay. 10 to the 15th. So I'm definitely not alone. How about if I killed all the bacteria and you just had viruses all over you, would you then be alone? You've been talking to philosophers. No, no, no I've been talking to biologists. When yeah, I ask biologists, are uh, viruses alive? Half of them say yes, half of them say no. You're, okay, it's, it's a very difficult question uh, because viruses do not have their own metabolism. They are dependent upon things that have their own metabolism in order to replicate. And then you could say, okay, right, well, we only define things as being alive that have their own metabolism and can support themselves independently. But if we apply that to humans, then we don't qualify as being alive because we require plants and animals, or plants at least as our food, and uh, then a definition of life that has humans as not being alive is not a very good definition, is it? I don't know. It's not one we'd be interested in because no, we want to be a right. member of the yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, so, so we have, in, in that sense, we, we have a, uh, a lifestyle that is not fundamentally different from that of a virus. Yeah. Nonetheless, I would not call a virus a form of life because it is incapable there's no there's no form of virus that could harness energy in any way so if there's viruses all over the universe but no bacteria then we would be alone well that is a bad example because if there are viruses all over the universe they came from somewhere that means they harnessed somebody's uh -huh. uh, metabolism and that would mean that by inference there were life forms that supported their evolution well, unless RNA, unless you're unless you're suggesting that it's possible to just construct viruses all by themselves i'm suggesting that the rna world sounds like a viral world and the rna world is one of the leading hypotheses for the origin of life and why wouldn't that should couldn't that be called a viral world it's pre-cellular life okay so you're saying, is RNA alive? That's what you're saying. Okay, let's go get a bottle of RNA. We can buy it, right, from the, from the chemical supplier, put it on the table and see what happens. We'll leave it there for four and a half billion years mm -hmm. and come back again mm -hmm. and see if anything has happened. Okay. Okay? Now, we're going we're gonna to take bets. Well, let's go now back. You're, I'm, I'm, now, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Let's put, I'm, let's, let's, I'm, we're placing our bets. Are you going to bet that that RNA, bottle of RNA, somehow became alive and crawled out and walked around the room? I've got another, let me answer uh, well, your question no. <laughs> with another question. I take, I go back four billion years ago when yeah. let's suppose that there was a hypothetical uh, RNA world. I take a scoop of this RNA world and put it in front of you and ask you, is that alive? Is that going to turn into something? And obviously it did turn into something, so I guess it's some way on the path towards life. I reject your premise. Because what is that premise? That there was an RNA world that you could take a scoop of. Ah, uh -huh. so you think so you think that people are doing RNA world research are not looking up the right, barking up the right tree? 
That was a suggested question, right? You just put an answer in my mouth. Is it you told me you started that? Your question started out with you think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The answer to the question is no. I don't think what you're telling me. I right. think. Right. So, <laughs> so what, why, why don't you so start it as a question right. rather so, rather than so telling are, me what I think? What are your views about the RNA world? Hypothesis. It's a construct. Okay, one of the roles of evolutionary biology is to put intellectual constructs uh, in between the forms that we know as intermediates to narrow the gap so that we can think about the problem, structure the problem, mm -hmm. and address it. That's what the RNA world is. The RNA world is an idea. It's a construct. It grew up out of the time when the issue was protein or DNA, what came first, chicken or egg problem. And there were great debates on this, this in the 1970s. And uh, these debates sort of went away when Tom Cech discovered that RNA is, has both genetic properties, because it, you know, it's a nucleic acid, and it also has catalytic properties. And then all of a sudden, it was quite obvious, and it didn't take long before, I think, Tom Cech discovered that in 83 or 84, mm -hmm. and Walter Gilbert in 1986 came up with the RNA world idea. It was actually more about introns than it was uh, about catalytic RNA, but it gave, it lent strength to the idea uh, that uh, before there were proteins or before there was DNA, there were nucleic acids that could replicate and had catalytic abilities. And this concept, in turn, stems from the work, uh, viral work, from the 1970s by Saul Spiegelman and Manfred Eigen uh, on a, an enzyme called q beta replicase that mm -hmm. is um, an, an enzyme that will replicate RNA precursors in the presence of activated nucleoside triphosphates. And um, uh, that those experiments showed that you could get molecules evolving in test tubes through replication mm -hmm. in, purely, in a purely chemical environment with no life in that sense, but you got variation and heredity in these replicating mm -hmm. molecules. That gave rise to the concept of molecular evolution, if you will, evolution among molecules, mm -hmm. a very satisfying concept, but requires a number of premises, uh, and those are that we had ribonucleoside triphosphates in large and specific amounts on an early earth that was cooled from magma contained rocks, the state of carbon was CO2, and it was generally not a very nice place to live. Therefore, I think the, the, the concept of an RNA world is very satisfying, but its likelihood of uh, being an accurate depiction of the historical track that led from CO2 to living things is virtually nil. Well, so the catalytic activity that ribozymes have could not be part of an early metabolism? That is again a suggestive question. Um, the catalytic activity that ribozymes have is the catalytic activity that they have. The catalytic act protein, uh, activity that proteins have is the catalytic right. activity that they have. What is more important than, in my view, than the catalytic activity of RNA or the catalytic activity of protein is the catalytic activity, what am I going to say now? I don't know. I don't of know. cofactors. Of cofactors. Vitamins. Vitamins perform the, the catalysis in almost most, if you look at uh, networks of metabolism today, modern metabolism, yeah. E. coli or methanogens or acetogens, they're good maps for these organisms and then map out the, um, map out the, the, the entire biochemical network of the cell. About half the proteins or more contain cofactors. The cofactors perform the catalysis and the proteins are just scaffolds that put the cofactor in place around an active site. There are many examples in metabolism mm -hmm. where the um, there's a wonderful example, it's a, an, an um, aminotransferase 
a paradoxal dependent amino transferase characterized by uh, Wolfenden. Wolfenden. Uh, the enzyme with the cofactor, pyridoxal phosphate, provides 10 to the 18th fold acceleration in the catalytic rate. 10 to the 10th of that is provided by the cofactor, and 10 to the 8th of it is provided by the protein. That is, the cofactor itself mm -hmm. um, does a good job of accelerating the reaction in the absence of the protein. So this is a I'm, very this is a fairly general phenomenon, yeah. maybe not in that magnitude throughout throughout metabolism. The cofactors do the catalysis, the proteins just hold them in place. And that's why there are a very small number of highly conserved cofactors and a large number of poorly conserved proteins. So if I've understood you correctly, as a version in your mind of proto-metabolism, you mm -hmm. prefer cofactors as a stronger explanatory explanation than ribozymes. Oh, that, absolutely. And I've gone into print in this, and that the, the, the cofactors um, they they perform the catalysis. Okay. And if you want anything like an RNA world, which you apparently do, because you're Marv, you're suggesting that I should want one. No, no I, <laughs> yes, I you did. I did. I did. Yes, you I did. did not. I did not. Go ahead. <laughs> and then, so if we if we if anybody wants an RNA world, yeah. then we've got to have four bases in large and specific amounts. The RNA world means replication, mm. duplication. If you're going to duplicate anything, you have to double the amount of precursors that you need to make that duplicate. Yeah. On the early earth, rocks, water, and CO2, good luck. All right? But it, So it's the cofactors that tend to channel chemical compounds and matter into likenesses of itself, okay, into, into specific routes, and that can, uh, that can lead to something that might be able to have genetic properties. But, um, so as, a, as an alternative, what, what, what do I suggest as an alternative to the RNA weld? Well, the hydrothermal vents are very interesting. The first guy to talk about hydrothermal vents in the context of origins of life was a man named John Corliss together with a man named John Barris. John Barris is a microbiologist at the uh, University of Washington. He'd be a good person to interview. Mm -hmm. And John and I had a small paper um, a couple of years ago. I mean, just. I write small assays with my friends because it's interesting and it's fun and you always learn something. It's called the concept of a ribofilm. And uh, the, 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 the heart of the RNA world is that there was some exponential growth of molecules and intense selection among them. This presumes that there were large amounts of specifically formed precursors with which this exponential growth could take place. We are suggesting that life in low energy environments where replication times are not exponential, replication in low energy environments, for example, in the, in the sediment off the coast of Denmark and stuff like that, there, there are microbes that live down there that have, they don't even talk about doubling times, just uh, turnover times. That is, one cell gives rise to another on the order of 1,000 years or 10,000 years. And so what we have there is uh, matter organized into the shape of life and generates uh, a copy of itself, maintains a copy of itself with a very low and stable energy flux, nothing exponential about it. And so if the first molecules were accumulating at some site where there was synthesis, first of all, they would not accumulate in any specific form. They would accumulate in clearly a variety of structures because the laws of thermodynamics and the kinds of chemical reactions that we have called kinetically controlled reactions and thermodynamically controlled reactions, provided that we have conditions far from equilibrium that any chemical reactions will take place in the first place, which hydrothermal plants offer, should generate a collection of molecules that will do exactly what life does, namely uh, polymerize, condense, fold into stable conformations, sit there and then promote condensations that have the property of catalysis. Okay, let me interrupt you for a second. Um, would you say that you are, based on what you described, I would have put you in the category of maybe a metabolism first rather than information first kind of guy? Or do you want to say that's not true? You don't like the Well, the, uh, uh, metabolism first, you're thinking of Gunter Vector Schweizer. Not necessarily. Well, people who say that think that. 
right? Well, not all of them. Mm. Not all, like Dyson, Freeman Dyson, for example, is not a picture guy. Um, yeah, but he's also not he's, a biology he's a physicist. But he is a metabolism first guy. Yeah, but it's... the uh, but, garbage uh, bags, and Segre is also a... Yeah, but uh, if you go through, if you go through, the, there, there are books out there on, about the origin of life that don't mention any organisms. And metabolism is also a thing that we tend to think of it as a kind of metabolism. And uh, I come from microbiology and physiology, okay, uh -huh. biochemistry and physiology. And uh, metabolism, is, uh, metabolism is diverse. It is extremely diverse. And there are lots of forms of, of metabolism out there. And so um, my approach to this problem has been a top-down approach looking among the life forms that we know today what might be primitive. And so that's not a metabolism first. That starts at the bottom up approach, right? We start from a metabolism first. Um, it's comparative physiology. Yeah, yeah. We start from what is alive today. Okay, there's a, that's a fundamentally yeah, different yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, extrapolating yeah. from what we see yeah, today, yeah. what might be ancient among, what is ancient yes, among yes, that? Yes, if that's not obvious. The, yes, yes. Uh, but if you think about it, so if, that's long, the if you, you think about it long enough, it does it does become obvious. So I, I would say it's comparative physiology. It's neither metabolism oh, first nor right. RNA first. It's comparative right. physiology. It comes from microbiology right. because Victor Slicer was a chemist, right? And the RNA world people are chemists. Uh -huh. And life is about biology. You're a and Dyson, Dyson, then? Dyson is a physicist. Okay, uh -huh. so chemists and physicists have had long uh -huh. and interesting debates about life, uh -huh. um, but. Very often these debates uh, take place without discussing the actual explanandum, which is life. Life is, biology is really hard. Life is okay. complicated. And so, when, once we understand that, then the, uh, these, these questions of metabolism or, or information first uh, become largely irrelevant. So I you're think. kind of saying the evidence first and the evidence is a phylogenetic tree and let's use that to figure out what's at the base and might be metabolism, might be that information. Is, that is also incorrect. Okay. Okay, uh, you're, 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 again, you're, you're saying, okay. you're right. saying phylogenetic tree. I am absolutely saying no, not a phylogenetic tree. Okay, correct. I'm, comparative physiology is looking at the, the, the physiology are the reactions that give rise to the energy that we use to generate cells from which the viruses that we were talking about in the beginning yes. arise. Yes. Okay, so it's the chemical, life is a chemical reaction. Okay. I'll repeat that one. Different kinds of chemical reactions. Yeah, I will repeat that one. Life is a chemical reaction. Furthermore, mm -hmm. all forms of life that we know are uh, energy-releasing chemical reactions okay. because if we don't release energy, mm -hmm. we will not take place. Okay. And what it is astounding that all forms of life that we know today, from the bacteria in my gut to the bacteria at the bottom of the ocean to the bacteria that live in the crust and the archaea that live in the crust and the archaea that live in my gut, and me and you, we are all descendants of one and the same energy-releasing chemical reaction that took place on the early Earth. And so, from in my view, the origin of life is the question of transition from a pre-existing geochemical reaction on the early Earth to one that is compartmentalized and catalyzed in such a way as it makes a copy of itself. Nonetheless, the, and so, so for all the chemical reactions that we know, that for, for us it's uh, oxidizing amino acids and lipids and sugars in our mitochondria with the help of oxygen to generate ATP, the universal energy currency, uh, and that drives all other processes in the cell, right, in, on using that energy currency. That's true for all cells that we know, okay? They, have, or they all have that. Viruses don't have that, but all cells that we know, they have this property. And, uh, it's, but it's not oxygen. The reaction is not lipids and sugars and amino acids and oxygen. There are many different kinds of chemical reactions that are energy releasing that can, uh, that can be used to generate this, uh, uh, to generate chem useful chem chemical energy in the form of ATP. Uh, my personal opinion is that the ancestral state, the most ancient form of chemical reaction uh, that cells use is the, is harnessing the redox energy, the chemical energy in the H2CO2 couple, that is hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, reacting with carbon dioxide. This is a reaction that is harnessed both by primitive bacteria, they're called acetogens, they take hydrogen and CO2 and convert it into acetate, that's their main energy yielding 
uh, reaction, exorganic, re that's their chemical reaction. They, they make acetate for a living and from the energy that's released in making acetate, they gain ATP. Where do these organisms live today? Anywhere where it's strictly anaerobic and there's hydrogen and CO2. For example? <sighs> Termite guts. Termite guts, how? Termite guts, uh, rumen, uh, and hydrothermal vents, and the Earth's crust. Okay. Okay? And then there's another form of, of uh, primitive metabolism, and that's the uh, that's manifest among the archaea, and they take hydrogen and CO2 and convert it into methane, strict anaerobes, and in the process of making methane, they also gen generate energy. Now, right? those that, two things that you just mentioned, the acetogens and the methanogens, yes. do, do the bacteria and the archaea in these groups, are they the shortest branched ones in a phylogenetic tree? Do they branch deeply? No. Are they the shortest branches? In a tree, in which tree? In some rooted phylogenetic tree. Well, what we've been doing recently, that's a, that would be your RNA tree. Well, ribosome 16S, I guess. Yeah, or? that would that, your standard tree. Um, in, uh, this is something that biologists have been doing for quite a long time, is making trees out of molecules, and this is something that uh, I have a great deal of experience and expertise in. And the one thing that we have learned most clearly from the study of trees is how misleading they can be. The main problem with trees that have many branches is that there are just so many possible trees. If you have a tree that has 36 leaves, okay, that is 36 organisms on the tips, that's a very small number, there are more possible trees for those 36 OTUs or 36 tips than there are protons. Well, OTU stands for? Um, operational taxonomical unit. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Operational tips. taxonomical there are, unit. You know, there are more possible trees for those 36 species mm -hmm than there are protons on Earth. Mm -hmm. That's a big number. And if we get up to about 55, 56, then there are more possible trees than there are protons in the universe. Mm -hmm. We're well beyond 10 to the 80th, all right? So there's a lot of trees. The chances that if we have a large number of sequences that we get the right tree are zero, okay? So we don't need to worry about getting the right tree. Now, People have been looking at one tree and then arguing, you know, one molecule like 16S, and now we use ribosomal proteins, which some of us were doing 20 years ago, uh, concatenated groups of ribosomal proteins to investigate trees, um, and uh, arguing very uh, about the, the order, the branching order, right, around the base or at the tips, mm -hmm. typically at the base, because the ancient stuff is always interesting. Um, I've stopped doing that. We make trees of everything thousands of trees, mm -hmm. in the knowledge that each individual tree will be wrong to some extent, but also under the assumption, under the knowledge that molecular evolution fundamentally works. Mm -hmm. You can make trees of cytochrome C or ribosomal RNA or mm -hmm. ribosomal proteins for vertebrates or animals, and you can get a tree that corresponds very well to the fossil record. There's always discrepancies, right? But uh, it corresponds largely. Right. The, uh, and the closer we get to the tips in the tree of organisms, the better molecular evolution works. And the deeper we go, the more problematic it becomes. Is that because of so horizontal gene transfer? Sorry? Is that because of horizontal gene transfer? Mm, no, it's it, even in the absence of horizontal gene transfer. The, just the, the phylogenetic methods fail. So you lose we, the homology. Let's, let's, let's say, let's pretend, let's pretend we've got a tree with uh, 36 taxa, okay? And you have to get, uh, what is it? It's N minus three internal edges. So that means 33 internal branches we have to get right, okay? Out of about 10 to the 50th, 10 to the 60th possibilities, okay? It's a lot of possibilities. And um, the, uh, and if we're trying to get all of those, you know, discriminate between 10 to the 50th possibilities with 300 amino acids, okay, across 36 species, good luck. There's not enough information. It, it's, it's very simple. There's just not enough information to recover all those branches. Therefore, we know that in phylogenetic trees, 
the, the trees are, are misleading us. Deeply. Why only 300 amino acids? Oh, as an example. Okay. You but, can I mean, also you take, take 3,000. Well, then it you does, have a lot more information. Does, yeah, but it doesn't get any better. Um, I'm surprised. Uh, and, and it's worse than that because you don't have a, um, you don't, we don't know, none of the models that anybody uses for phylogeny are corroborated on real, on, uh, in real life. They're all assumptions, uh, assumptions about uh, the way that uh, molecules behave over long evolutionary times, and none of those assumptions are provable, right? It's all assumptions, and then people get into big debates about comparing the likelihood of trees, mm -hmm. okay, as if likelihood was equivalent with truth. Yeah, and what is happening now with large data sets that people are using to infer individual, to infer single trees, is that the results become entirely model dependent and no longer data dependent. And that means that you can take your model and adjust it, and this is what people do, right? And adjust the parameters mm -hmm. basically to get the result that you want. So our approach to this, the, the, the question was, do acetogens and methanogens branch deeply? Yeah. The answer is, no, actually was yes, they, do they have short branches? Is what do I they have short branches? Yes, there's a difference. Um, actually, actually, they do, mm -hmm. and there's probably a reason for that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, why would you? Why would you ask it? So, so what we've been doing is doing all trees, mm -hmm. and then asking questions, uh, posing questions to these trees, uh, very specific sorts of questions, under the premise that molecular evolution fundamentally works, and if it does, we will see tendencies among these trees uh, to say the same thing. Yes. Yes. So, so what you've just said is not well, a very I, good answer. But before we go in for, why are you asking short? Nobody asks that question. Uh, well, I do. And the reason is I've convinced myself that there's a very important distinction to be made between deep and short. And short, short is a more objective term, and deep is a subjective one. But we probably should, <laughs> we can talk about that later. Okay. Well, actually, what short means is that the sequences have not evolved very much. And in the case of acetogens and methanogens, mm -hmm. there are some groups that in fact have extremely short branches. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they have um, not evolved very much. Right, they're closer to the root. Be, well, that they've early optimized and that there are severe constraints right. in their very narrow right. ecological right. niche and as to what they can do. And therefore they're better representatives of the LUCA. That's a suggested question that I would not object to. Okay. okay. Good. Good. You've objected to almost everything. <laughs> no. else. I'm still paying attention to what, putting words in my mouth. Right, well, if you, if you, you are better, fully if you, capable if you, of putting if, them in your own. If, if you if you if you give me better words, okay. well, I, I'm doing the best job I can, and uh, you're you're yeah. a gainsaying okay. me. That's good. Come on, Charles. So, is the question "Are we alone?" an important question in your mind? No, but it's an important question in many people's minds. So why not in yours? I'm, I've got other problems, <laughs> okay? Um, it's not something that I can answer. It's not something that I can work on. It's something that you can think about. Um, so, but wait, you, you just said you think we're not alone because of your estimate of the probability of, of life happening elsewhere, and in your mind it was yes. And so I would have thought that that's an integral part of what you can come to, you can conclude that based on an understanding of how life got started on Charlie, this Charlie, the question was, is it important to yes. me? Yes. The answer is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I think about it from time to time and I get this I, I'm, question. I'm trying to ask, but why is it important? Why is it important? <laughs> because I, there are more important things to, to work on. Right, what's and the most important thing? It's not tractable. Okay. I see. okay. It, it is not tractable. It's important it, if it, it were it's, tractable. It's, it's, it's similar to the question. Dr. Martin, um, okay, could it be that there are other forms, you know, after my origin of life talk, could it be that there are other forms of life that have gone extinct and, mm -hmm. we, you know, we haven't, and, and they, they existed and they went extinct? And I said, certainly, but um, they don't, uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist mm -hmm. in the sense, or I'm a natural scientist that I'm trying to explain things, the observations, mm -hmm. and when we're done explaining the life that we know, then we can worry about the kinds of life that we can imagine and have no evidence for. Okay, right, now you're laughing. So, well, so, so, so that's, well, you said so no that's evidence, but then again, when I asked you why do you say we're not alone, you cited at least indirect evidence for our thoughts. 
Well, the probability. It's a probability calculation. Well, the, that's, it's, uh, okay. that's evidence. We don't mm, no, it's not. No, it's guesswork. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? All what? science is guesswork. All right, time. now now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Right, that's right. This, uh, there there are no facts. Uh, one of my favorite sayings uh, for the students here. There okay. are no facts. If you're going to be like that, you use the word proof. No, Don't no, use no. the word proof ever in science. That, that's right. There are right. no facts. There are right. only observations okay. and their interpretation. Okay. So now a lot of the, the, I, I do astrobiology, and a lot of people describe. Would you call yourself an astrobiologist? No. Okay. Why not? Well, okay. I'm interested on that life that I'm interested in the life that exists on Earth and its biochemical mechanisms and processes, similarity to those processes to, to spontaneous processes going on at hydrothermal vents, and that can be um, simulated in wonderful, simple ways in the laboratory. And um, so, if we say, right, but Dr. Martin, you're you're investigating life and. Is that not astrobiology? Well, in that sense, the Earth is in space, so mm -hmm. it is, it's a definition, but I would not consider myself an astrobiologist because astrobiologists are concerned about, you know, life on other heavenly bodies. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned we, Encellus. I, indeed, I did, because it re reflects um, a chemistry that I think from the study of life on Earth mm -hmm. could have given rise to life on Earth, mm -hmm. and therefore that chemistry is mm -hmm. relevant and mm -hmm. interesting. And of course, what NASA is doing, mm -hmm. rightly or not rightly so, is they're selling their space program, the exploration of these, these uh, deep territories, not in order to have better mining capabilities or to bring strange gases back from other planets, mm -hmm. but looking for life. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that people want to know, mm -hmm. right? This, this is something that- But that, you don't want to know? I'm busy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm too busy to well, ask that question. Well, we've, we've got enough to do. I've got my hands full right. with the things that we can see here on Earth. All right, let me and stop when, you. When, I'm done, if, that, when right. I'm done with that, I'll worry about the stuff so on I've other planets. So I've asked you, if, are we alone? In, is it that an important question? You said not to you. So what is the most important question that you're dealing with right now? The, the, how was it possible to get from rocks and water and carbon dioxide, which is what we had on the early Earth after it cooled from being a boiling ball of magma after the moon forming impact, uh, how did we get from that to things that live? All right. Now the problem is, is that that's talking about the origin of life. Mm -hmm. Now, we know for a fact that, for a fact, for a fact, I rarely use that word, okay? <laughs> we know for a fact that all uh, discussion about the origin of life is unfalsifiable conjecture, okay? It is not science in the strict sense, because even if we could make a reactor, we put chemicals in on one side, mm -hmm. right, in the laboratory, now it comes E. coli with the wrong genetic code, mm -hmm. we still can't prove that Mm -hmm. Our ancestors, our ancestors arose that way. Mm -hmm. We would just have a narrative mm -hmm. that would make the whole thing more plausible. Okay, it will stay that way. The origin of life on, on this planet is a one-off thing. It happened once for the organisms that are alive today, and uh, it's irretrievably lost. Unless Nonetheless, it, unless it's a unique solution, and we'll find it. Maybe there's only one way to do what we see here. That's possible, but what do you mean we'll find it? We already have found it. We're looking at it. But that doesn't tell us it's a unique solution. No, but maybe there's only one pathway from inorganic to the stuff we have today. I think that's probably not a good bet, but I would bet that if we find something that is growing in the real sense of taking substrates, making more of itself, and dividing, mm -hmm. Uh, or, or, or increasing in mass, it doesn't necessarily need to divide, right? Life can just increase in mass without yeah. dividing, but it has to be compartmentalized. Uh, if we find something else, uh, something doing that on other heavenly bodies, then the chances are it will look very similar chemically to what we have uh, on, on Earth. Let me try to put more words in your mouth. We'll see whether it'll work. <laughs> you just said, I'm interested in how did life, how did life arise, and I'm not interested in how does life arise. 
That's correct, because we have evidence that life did arise. Uh -huh. We don't have evidence that life does arise. Okay. Therefore, the, the, the uh, question, how does life arise, mm -hmm. is a, a completely hypothetical question. Okay. It contains lots of premises and lots of assumptions about what is alive and where we can find it. And I don't work that way. I'm trying to explain, I'm a natural scientist in the classical sense. I'm trying to figure out how life, living things, the things that we know and see and watch grow, mm -hmm. how they arose, which is a fundamentally different avenue of scientific endeavor than our any world. It's mm -hmm. fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. Right. It's fundamentally different because I'm I'm worried about the the natural observations, but, and the RNA world is is wrapped up in uh, concepts and premises that the, that uh, this kind of replication has anything to do with the actual life process. But I would have thought that surely you'd be interested in the in the result, very recent result, that we think that rocky Earth-like planets with water on the surfaces, mm -hmm. in or near habitable zones, are so are almost around every star in the in the universe. Yeah. So yeah. I would and have thought that would be of interest to you because, but only because what you've studied on one, I mean, the Earth is a planet like these mm -hmm. other ones, mm -hmm. and if what you study here can be extrapolated, just like when we study the mass pro the ratio of masses of protons to electrons here, it's the same all over the universe. Well, I'm glad that NASA is invested with it, that NASA and ESA and uh, all these scientists are probing out into space and looking around and finding planets. I think uh, actually more interesting is the recognition that the icy moons around big glass, uh, big gas planets can harbor exactly the same chemistry that I happen to think Mm -hmm. was relevant for the origin of life and I can name some names of people who go into press in the New York Times and saying that this kind of chemistry is irrelevant to life. Mm. Boy, I guess they must know that for a fact somehow. Mm -hmm. How do they know that? They don't know whether it's irrelevant. They don't have a clue. And um, so uh, the, the, um, the, the habitable zone, right, these, these planets, Earth-like planets, they don't even have to be Earth-like. They can be large gas planets outside, way, it expands the habitable zone a lot. Water and rock. And, and, but because they have water, rocks, and they have to have heat so that you get hydrothermal con convection. So that's interesting information, okay? But it's only interesting in terms of looking for evidence of processes that some of us think gave rise to life on this planet based upon um, conditions that are uh, based upon um, uh, yeah, conditions that are more well constrained than things that we can just infer from uh, long telescopes. Right. Enceladus, the Cassini mission was a really significant mission. Hmm. So there is this uh, controversy between people like you who support the hydrothermal vent model mm. and other people who say, oh no, I need UV radiation at the surface. Mm. So what do you think of that controversy? Well, any comments? Yeah, gladly. Then there are no forms of life that live from UV light, and there are reasons for that. UV light sterilizes things. <laughs> okay, UV light <laughs> destroys organic compounds. So, uh, whereas the the chemistry at hydrothermal vents is synthetic, it, it generates organic compounds rather than synthesize, uh, rather than uh, destroy them. And so the, the UV light is all very convenient, and uh, it's, it's nice. It goes back to, to uh, what's the name of that guy? 1910, he was doing some experiments, uh, shining UV light on CO2 and water, and he got reduced organic compounds. It, it's cited in the Stanley Miller paper in 1953, which is then a method to generate organic soup. This is the same organic soup that Haldane and, and Oprah were propagating as the origin of life. That was, however, a hundred years ago before we knew anything about how life actually works. Uh -huh. When the Stanley Miller experiment was done, we didn't. We were just now learning that ATP uh, is a universal energy currency. We had no idea how it was actually made. That wasn't solved until the late 1960s, and Peter Mitchell didn't get a Nobel Prize until 1974. Life is really. We were walking around and on the moon and bringing rocks back before we knew how ATP is really synthesized in life. So biology is really hard. So what do I say about the, 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 the debate uh, UV light versus chemical energy? If you have any clue about 
the kinds of light, the kinds of energy that life harnesses, then UV light is irrelevant because there's no connection between any UV catalyzed reaction and living and, and energy harnessing in living cells. It does not connect. Now, the RNA world people or the, or the UV light people or the organic soup people will then say, well, but we're still allowed, you know, don't be so constrained about the, the kinds of life that we see today. And I say, don't allow yourself so much imagination as to drift, as to let your research drift off from the explanandum. The explanandum is life and not something that we think is like life uh -huh. uh, in, uh, in, let's go back, let's, let's do the experiment, right? Let's take the, the little tube of RNA, put it on the table and wait four billion years. Okay. <laughs> You're laughing, I've made my point. Well, I'm not laughing in the same way that you think I'm laughing. <laughs> now, well, of, no, that's, that's an assumption. You're putting words in my mouth again. Now, um, a lot of astronomers in particular, I guess, agree with your idea that once you have life, you have intelligent life. Uh, now, if that's the case, then the uh, universe should be filled mm -hmm. with uh, artificial life, and life mm -hmm. that has evolved. So, for example, Martin Rees thinks that, hey, we shouldn't be looking for squishy life based on water. We should be looking for cameras and satellites and uh, the, the type of things that we presume we will be sending all over the universe yeah. in a hundred years or a thousand years or well, ten thousand years. Well, we're sending them outside the solar system now. Yes. This is things that we do. But right? we don't, haven't headed them for other, uh, mm -hmm. other stars yet, but presumably we will soon. Mm -hmm. And th so those are the things that a uh, advanced civilization, technological civilization would do. Mm -hmm. And therefore those are the things that we should look for rather than look on the surface of planets for squishy life. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I think the probability of getting microbes, microbial life, is orders of magnitude higher than the probability of getting complex life, that is eukaryotes, and that is again orders of magnitude higher than uh, getting intelligent life. You want to give us a number of magnitudes? Two, three, four, ten, a thousand, a billion? Well, you can estimate uh, that about 10 to the 40th microbes have ever lived in Earth history. It's actually not a very complicated calculation. There are about 10 to the 30th today, and then you take an average doubling time, right, and, or conservative doubling time, and then take biomass into consideration. You can come up with about 10 to the 40th microbes that have ever lived, right? We call it 10 to the 50th, we're going to add 10 orders of magnitude. But among those 10 to the 40th that have ever lived, only one association of one archaeon and one bacterium gave rise to, to complex cells, okay? Are you suggesting that endosymbiosis is not a common feature of evolution? It's an observation that endosymbiosis is not a common feature of evolution. But for mitochondria that might be the case, but for plastids that's not the case. For plastids, it is the same rate, once in four billion years. I thought the there were multiple examples of endosymbiosis of plastids. Um, you're confusing primary symbiosis and secondary symbiosis. And I'm tertiary sorry. as well. And tertiary as well and quaternary, okay? But they all go back to the, the microbial, uh, the, the origin of the, the introduction of the photosynthetic That's machinery it. into the eukaryotic lineage, which was a singular event. That happened exactly once, the same rate as the origin of mitochondria. Okay, okay so once, in, once, once in four, mitochondria, once in once four in plastids. That's correct. I see. And uh, then, the plants, no... however, are not intelligent, therefore they are not relevant to this discussion. You're talking about the oh. probability of intelligent life. So the, okay. the, the intelligent life that we know has mitochondria and has nerve cells, we're not photosynthetic, okay? If we were, we wouldn't need all these nerve cells to run around, we could just sit there and photosynthesize. So did you just say that plants were not intelligent? That is correct. Okay, is life getting more complex? Is that a direction that you're comfortable with giving to life? The the, well, both, both processes happen. The prokaryotes have stayed prokaryotic. This, this one association, okay, so you wanted to probably, 10 to the 40th cells, one association led to eukaryotes. That's one in 10 to the 40th. That's a very small number, okay? That's the problem, that is the observed that the one-off observed frequency, it's not a problem, it's the frequency of uh, eukaryotes arising from prokaryotes. Let me stop you there. Some people would argue for competitive exclusion as the ex it happened many times, but you have competitive exclusion, therefore it can only happen once. 
they've got a lot of imagination. They're, they're, <laughs> assuming, they're assuming things that went extinct and then using that as evidence to support their case, and there's a fundamental problem in the strength of that argument. If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? $100 billion. Caveat, you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone? Okay, do I have to, do I have to spend it honestly, or can I? Any way you want. Okay, then I'd say we do a drilling program to drill deep within the Earth in search of different forms of life on Earth, oh. okay, to find out whether we're not alone on Earth because it's tractable and we can maybe oh. see something in human lifetimes. Um, the, maybe the, the, do, you, do, you, do you know how long it takes for, you, you know how long it takes when they, send, when they send a signal from NASA to Cassini, right? or from ESA to Cassini. You know how long it takes for the light signal to get there? Uh, let me guess, it would be about, about an hour or so. Yeah, one and a half hours, 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so you gotta have a lot of patience. And um, with the drilling program, we might discover some very interesting things mm -hmm. about uh, life in the crust. And uh, the theory that I uh, defend, that life arose at hydrothermal vents, has as its um, first, Corollary. Corollary. Very good. Thank you. But word word, put a wonderful word in my mind. That was exactly the word I was looking for. Okay. The first corollary, that the, the first habitats on life that were inhabited were the crust. Uh, and the cetogens and methanogens that live there off of H2 and CO2 have been inhabiting that same niche, not the same crust, because submarine crust has you know maximum age of about 250 million years. It's constantly being subducted in the Wilson cycle. But the niche is the, the same and the process of serpentinization where water comes down and crust generates the hydrogen that these guys live off of mm -hmm. is also the same and that's been going on since there's been since the the crust has been solid and um, uh, so uh, investigating that niche to find out what's going on down there would generate interesting insights into uh, life on this planet, okay? So you drill they, they, some they, holes. They, if, we were to, if we were to give uh, the, uh, Deborah Kelly and John Barris at the University of Washington the NASA budget to go down and investigate lost city and hydrothermal vents, deep sea hydrothermal vents, we would learn more about the origin of life in our lifetime than we're going to learn from Cassini missions. Nonetheless, Cassini is really interesting. Okay, the the the, the moon, uh, the Saturn moons, and the icy moons around Jupiter—they're really interesting. So, so you it's wouldn't good. invest it's in telescopes to look for uh, I love, chemical I love, disequilibrium. I, 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 love, I love pictures. I'd say, give them give them some money to do some telescopes. Definitely, okay. got to do those rockets. <laughs> got, got to get the telescopes. The uh, I uh, what was the what was the the big telescope that did all the beautiful pictures? Hubble. 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 Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. That, it get, so that's great. So would you use any of this hundred billion dollars to uh, let's say? Look, make really good electron microscopes that could look for nano aliens in this room, for example, little spaceships that are nano aliens? Nope. Okay. Now, your neurons don't know that they're in your head. Any individual neuron doesn't know that it's part of you. Do you think we could be part of an alien in that way? That's a completely ridiculous question. <laughs> what, where did you come up with that? Who, who told you to ask that question? The answer is no. Look, I come from Texas, and I have a German passport, and we don't have things like that where I come from. So, so <laughs> you're we don't, we, we don't have aliens. Aliens, aliens ate my husband. Okay, so, we don't we don't so have that at my so institute. So your answer, to, so your answer to the question, are we inside an alien, is. No. Yet. <laughs> yet. Okay, yet. Not, not no, yet. not, not at all. <laughs> so, all right, Excuse are me. we living in a simulation? Probably not. Oh, you're, you're much more skeptical about well, that. Give me some proof. Well, I don't give proof. I'm a scientist. I'm not a mathematician. See, see, okay. And so <laughs> <laughs> this is philosophy, right? All right, so here's, a, here's an argument that astrobiologists sometimes use. They say, if there's some aspect that has of life that has evolved multiple times independently on Earth, then those aspects become candidates for what we should expect life to be have elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? Not fundamentally flawed. 
period. Okay, so you think there are such things as independently evolved aspects of life? Wings, insects, Wings. bats, birds. Okay. okay, one example. Convergence. They're both quadrupeds, yeah. they're both Con moving the front legs. Convergence all over the place. You've got mimicry, you've got flowers, so, flowers that evolve to look like insects so that they will become pollinated by bees looking for partners, etc., etc., etc. So you've read Simon Conway Mars' book maybe on this life solution. It's kind of like the Bible of convergence. No, no. no. But anyway, you're a convergentist in that sense. I, for example, I would push back and say that are, the, flight yeah, the question is, are you a convergentist? And the answer is no. <laughs> no, convergence is more the, the exception than well, the rule. Well, anyway, there, there seems to be a debate going on between what I call deep homology and convergence. Deep, convergence is what Simon Conway Morris says and what you just said about, for example, flight. Now, flight, you said, we said it's independent because the common ancestor mm. of birds mm. and, let's say, bats did not fly. Therefore, it evolved independently on two lineages. Yeah. On the other hand, what, what are these two creatures doing? They're both quadrupeds, and they're both flapping the front, their front paws. Yeah, that's right. Now, I would have thought that that means that there's some deep homology about moving your front paws up and down that is part of flight. Uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, a, 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 not a um, productive, nicht gewinnbringend, uh, not, not a productive avenue of thought because it's definitions, all right? Okay. It's all semantics. But you use the word convergence as in both flight. And there I was is. giving you a counterexample, so now you said we're not even going to talk about it because it's too plagued with definitional ambiguity. Um, no, not. <laughs> You're putting words in my mouth okay. again. Okay. Correct. Me. The, the uh, convergence occurs, right? There is uh, the the evolutionary process brings forth very interesting things, such as eyes. And there was a there, I learned in college that eyes evolved 18 times independently. That's wrong. Eyes evolved once. It's basically the same, the same... That's what uh, I would argue. That's called yeah. deep homology, by the way. Well, uh, now you're a deep homologist. No, now you're a labelist. Okay? <laughs> you're labeling me, don't know. Uh, I'm not an ist. Mm -hmm. okay? Okay. I don't belong to anybody's camp. Okay? I'm, I'm, Even a Bill Martinist. You're a Bill Martinist. No, I also don't that. belong to my own camp oh, because it. what if I'm wrong? Okay. All right? All right. So, the uh, putting putting things into into labels um, does not does not uh, it's generally unproductive. It's good for the sake of argument, but generally unproductive. Okay. Life itself it it, evol it evolves divergent solutions and convergent solutions, starting with uh, a, uh, the, the the certain um, metabolic repertoire mm -hmm. that can give rise. But it but not everything is realizable. For example, with the bilateral symmetry that we have and the, the Hox genes that generate the, our body plans during development from insects on to humans, there are certain possibilities that are excluded among them radial symmetry. Okay, that doesn't work very well. But you, in your head, when, you, when, when I said you learned in college there were 18 different right. independent or, or evolution of eyes, right. and you said that's not right, it's only one. What you were saying that's what today, that's what we think. What today. you were saying is that you were looking at the fundamental biochemistry of vision and saying, "Hey, that's the same in all these supposedly independent ones, right?" Yes, yeah, right. Now I'm trying to do the same thing with every example of convergence. For example, the wings. I was talked about the flapping of the front mm, legs, yeah. but you don't go there with that one. That it's a that it is a a, a pre-adaptation to flight. I would say pre-adaptation, but it is one of the things that's involved in what we call flight, and that existed in the in the common ancestor of these two supposedly the independent. Things. The existence in the common ancestor does not determine in uh, 600 uh, million years of evolution what those organs will evolve into. Determine? It is potential. It is potential. But I'm trying to undo convergence with a deep homology argument that you kind of used when you said there's only one example of the evolution of eyes. Well, the, the fundamental molecular machinery that's used for eyes is used in many different lineages. And it can even be transplanted through molecular genetics. A great example by Walter, the late Walter Gehring, who took the genes for eye development from mice, put it into 
flies and then got ectopic expression and they started developing you know, eyes on their wings. So that was a, a very dramatic example of, uh, of that, that basic machinery uh, having the ability to induce a particular organ in a, in a different organism. So the, the fact that we, the observation, I hate the word fact, the observation that we have the potential in an evolutionary ancestor to bring forth particular forms from humans to snakes to whales to moles to bats, Okay. Now you're talking about diversity. Yes, but, but, it, but they, this is this the evolutionary potential is present in that mam, mammalian. Did, uh, what, yes, I only mentioned mammals there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I okay, so. I think so. Um, uh, in that uh, the mammalian common ancestor, which was probably a small, furry little creature that ran around in the woods at night a couple hundred million years ago, mm -hmm. there's there's no way that we could look at that organism, right? That ancestor. Mm -hmm. And say, oh, you're going to, you have the potential to bring forth this diversity. But that's not the or, question. Uh, snakes, I use snakes, so okay. that's definitely not mammals. Okay, right? just use vertebrates. Yeah. But the whole, that's not the question. The question is not that we can predict the divergence and diversity from a common ancestor, but right. rather whether in among two lineages that right. come from a common ancestor, isn't it, al isn't it always the case that the most fundamental aspect of whatever they're going to converge on will be already in the common ancestor? That's I do not follow that logic at all because you that, did that with eyeballs. Well, then, then, then let's no, let's let's take physiology or let, let's take uh, hair or or size mm -hmm. because the environment changes. The environment changes, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and one does not need to adapt. One can also go extinct. One can yes, also yes, run yes. away from that environment and yes. not <laughs> and not not uh, colonize it. And so the evolutionary process is an interplay between genetic potential. And, um, and environmental opportunity. Selection and this, pressure. The, mm, yes, this can bring forth um, similar solutions in different lineages, and it can bring forth, um, so, so the, the specific genes, okay, let's, let to, to, to deconstruct your example, the specific genes that are involved in wing development mm -hmm. in the bat, mm -hmm. and the bird, mm -hmm. and the insect, mm -hmm. do not, it did not exist in that common ancestor in their functional form. Nonetheless, the potential, the potential mm -hmm. to, to bring forth mm -hmm. those genes and, and those morphologies did exist. But at the same time, that's the same potential to bring forth eukaryotes existed in the common ancestor of bacteria and archaea that lived four billion years ago, we think, based upon isotope data mm -hmm. uh, for the age of life. Nonetheless, that organism or as before it was an organism, it was something even simpler, mm -hmm. right, that had the potential to bring forth an organism, that in no way was, was that genetic potential um, on a vector to bring forth anything. It right. just happened. Okay. Okay? So that, that's, why, that's why I think the, the, the argument is too simple to say that potential is there because the genes evolved, the genomes evolved, the, you duplicate and, and, and acquire, right, if you're a prokaryote, and you duplicate if you're a eukaryote. Have you ever seen a UFO? No, but I saw a cow that I thought was a bear for a little while. That scared the tar out of me. You saw a cow? <laughs> when I was with my father in Colorado. We came around Ben and said, it's a, it's a bear. It's a bear. Well, that bear went moo. <laughs> when it turned around, I said, no, I have not seen, I've never seen a UFO. Okay. I've seen some very dramatic um, um, Stanschnuppen, um, uh, shooting stars. Uh -huh. uh, I love to look at the sky. Okay. So what do you think of this dichotomy that humans project onto these aliens of they're either good or bad? Is that just stupid and you don't want to think about it? If we knew of any aliens, we'd have to worry about it. Okay. The, I, I, the, if we're worried about anything coming from space, we need to worry about meteorites, and that kind of thing. Not advanced aliens that you believe that are out there? Nope, because how many meteorites have we seen that come close to Earth? How many meteorites have we seen have hit Earth, uh -huh. created craters? A couple of years ago, there was a big one that exploded in Russia. 
1918, it was a big, very big one that exploded above Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, how old is the meteorite crater in Arizona? A oh, couple, maybe 10,000? Yeah, 20, not 000? that. It's very clean, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is something that happens on right, maybe the Sheik's Galoob, uh, crater, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Big and nasty. Uh, this is stuff that happens on a regular basis. We know that it happens. And this is, in principle, something to worry about. Okay? We have justified reason to believe that things from outer space will hit the earth and cause us problems. None of them have landing legs and things come so crawling, crawling out to, to have a conversation with so us. So you disagree with Stephen Hawking when he thinks we should keep our heads down? He doesn't I, think we I disagree. I, uh, the late Stephen Hawking. Yes, yes. Um, yes, I would disagree with that. I think we should keep our, not our heads down, we should keep our nose to the grindstone. Okay. <laughs> okay? Life is short and we need to use the time that we've got to, uh, to utilize that uh, to, to make progress. We need to do something with our life, right? Because we, you never know how long it's going to last. Worrying about what kinds of aliens uh, we need to worry about is not one of the things I do. We need to, the, we need to worry about the kinds of uh, objects that might hit, hit Earth okay. from space because we have evidence that this happens on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, if a big one's going to hit, there's nothing we can do about it. But if small ones are going to hit, maybe there's something we can do about it. Okay. And it's a uh, productive use of our time okay. for the good of mankind. Worrying okay. about aliens will... Uh, so I don't have those kind of thoughts. I wonder about what kind of aliens okay. uh, might we encounter. Have you seen the movie Contact? No. The, the Jude, with Jodie no, Foster? No, I saw um, uh, Close Encounters of the Third okay. Kind. And in the movie Contact, uh -huh. the, the, lead, the lead character is asked the following question. Are we alone? And the answer is, well, if we are alone, it would be an awful waste of space. What do you think of that comment? Any comment? It's a good line. It's a good line. <laughs> okay. it's, a good, it's a good line. Um, but uh, the, the, um, there's no principle in the natural sciences that dictates that space has to be used in any particular way. Mm -hmm. there, are some people, there are some people who would argue that life is an imperative, mm -hmm. right? That cosmic imperative. A, Christian cos do. A, a cosmic imperative. Now, that means that... I would have thought that we you would agree with that. Is that not right? Uh, the only thing that's imperative is death. Life is an opportunity. Death is a certainty. Okay? So it's possible, right, to evolve life, but it's definitely not a requirement. Okay, not a cosmic imperative. There's no imperative, right? This is also, uh, I'm not, I can't remember whether Dudu um, coined that phrase. Uh, he did. But, when, when but Mike during, Russell. No, 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 during his, uh, when he was still uh, religious. Well, he, uh, he in, in, in his last book, he said, "Okay, look, I've, I've given up on 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 the on the religion. This has to, also has to do with determinism, oh, and yeah. do we have? Is there is there a God? Is there uh, is there something forcing life to uh, forcing the process to of of life to go in particular directions?" Uh -huh. and, and um, so I, I wasn't aware. I, I, that, I would say it's chance, right? Go ahead. I wasn't aware of that. So you think Christian Dudu's statement about life being a cosmic imperative is associated with him? becoming less religious? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to go back through, the, through history and see when the, when the cosmic imperative came up. It, yeah. I don't think it came up cosmic in... Cosmic Dust, um, I think. Cosmic Dust. Yeah. Uh, was that his last book? No. 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 Yeah, I think that was before, that was before he, oh. he gave up on his... I didn't uh, know he gave up on his yeah. religious beliefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, so, speaking of religious... Uh, uh, the, in, in terms of uh, explaining scientific phenomena. Okay. Right. Uh, some people are looking for SETI. They're radio telescopes looking for intelligence. Mm -hmm. with, and uh, some, they're looking uh, to the idea that intelligent life would build a radio telescope and then have evolved for, I don't know, billions of years longer than we have on this planet mm -hmm. seems to suggest that and they're looking for essentially omniscient aliens, which is a little like looking for God. Mm -hmm. so, so do you think SETI researchers are in some sense looking for God? No, I think they're looking for, for omniscient aliens. They're they're, they're <laughs> looking for 
aliens who have enough time and money on their hands to signal, <laughs> send signals out <laughs> in space that okay. could by chance get in, go in our direction. Right. Um, I'm not going to say that that, um, that kind of research is, although it's, you know, it's, it's, that is the, the epitome of high risk well, high yeah, uh, research. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, let's, you know, you can complain about your tax dollars, but I'd say this is one of those things. Let's go ahead and do it to, just to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just, so you support see, just, just, just to see whether we can do it. Okay. Yeah, right. We don't need to increase it by a factor of a <laughs> hundred. Okay. Um, you know Fermi's paradox? Like, where are they? If you think that there are intelligent aliens elsewhere, then they have had plenty of time to colonize the entire galaxy. Yeah. Because if you make a rocket ship go at only one-tenth the speed of light, it only takes you a million years to go from one end of the galaxy to the other. There have been yeah. many oh, yeah. 10,000 intervals of Boy. one million years. Time so therefore, travel. So where are they? So that's Fermi's paradox. Right. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? No, I think his premises are flawed. Which, uh, what's, what's the premise <laughs> that's most flawed? We have no evidence uh, that there is um, ability, uh, that there are technological capabilities to, in, to generate spaceflight of the kind that would get us uh, from one solar system to another, from one galaxy to another, with beings on those spaceships or uh, or instruments on those spaceships that would survive the travel. But okay? I'm so so the, it, it's based on the premise that, oh, it must be so easy to get from I galaxy to galaxy. I and I don't, I, I, I reject that premise. Yes. Therefore, I don't find it to be a paradox at all. I think it's an intellectual construct based on a flawed premise. Wait, wait, so let me get this straight. So what you're... I asked you earlier about whether you thought we were alone in terms of intelligent life. You said no, there'll be intelligent life somewhere. But now you're saying that that intelligent life will never develop the capacity to spaceships to travel to other stars. No, never is not what I said. I said it's not. It, this is not um, the, the uh, among the list of technological advances that we can imagine. I use the word never because uh, let's say that there were a thousand or ten thousand or three mm. technological civilizations, mm. but none of them will have the ability, none okay. of them will develop okay. this capability. Okay. So, so the, the, the probability calculation that we had earlier, right, the, the probability of complex life, eukaryotes, it's a basically one in 10 to the 40th on this planet proposition. Right? And there's, there's no imperative that it had to happen. It did happen, right? Um, intelligent life of all the eukaryotes that have ever lived, which is a much smaller fraction than, uh, a much smaller number than 10 to the 40th, I, well, let's just pull a number out there. Let's call it 10 to the 20th, right? One lineage, right, it became humans, right? And we've now got 10 to the 9 of those, 10, almost 10 to the 10. And um, um, so, you know, it's a low probability of, of coming up with, with intelligence, but it's, you can put numbers on it. Now, how do, we, how do we estimate the probability of technologies that will allow us, or anybody, or anything, to get from one galaxy to another in such a state, right, that, uh, that the, the uh, object that was sent from Earth, or from wherever we send it, would have any meaning or significance other than just an impact body when it when it got wherever it's going. It doesn't know where it's going. So I, I, I cannot imagine that, therefore I don't have any thoughts that deal with that. Okay. Now, what do you think are the public's or students' biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? I don't presume that students or public have any misconceptions about are we alone now if we you know go to the grocery store abducted by aliens my <laughs> my husband sounds like a misconception to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very unlikely to be true um, uh, nonetheless this uh, this kind of press is out there and gets you, read you, and does does uh, does uh, and does, you are an American reach, so you're fully aware reach, of something. I, I used to be an American <laughs> yeah. now I'm a German okay, okay. but in, in Germany we also have the same sort of press it's not quite as as uh, it doesn't it, it, it steep quite as low as that, but uh, it, it, 
it tends to on occasion. The, the, the aliens thing is something that you can, playing with people's fear is a very dangerous thing to do, we've learned, mm -hmm. right? Appealing to people's fears. Mm -hmm. So you think people have misconceptions about the question, are we alone, because they have misconceived, they have fear that is not supported? You can have fears that are... Rational. That are, that are um, nurtured yes. by people trying to make money off of them. Fear or people, or people trying to gain power from them. And both the United States and Germany have had experience with that, right? Playing with people's fears. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. So let's not play with their fears about what might be out there in space, right. and then, and then, uh, well, because, because you can imagine, you can imagine um, a government that says, "We have to do something about the threat of aliens from space, and therefore we're going to take our tax dollars and then go investigate this problem." A hundred billion dollars, for example, is the is the number you you named, mm -hmm. right? Not that I would name, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so we have to watch out about that. But that's what you're doing, is pointing because out a big it's misconception. Much more, it's, it's much more important to, um, to have a good health system, uh, to have good employment, and to have good, good, edu good education. Uh, also, in countries that uh, lie outside the border of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, it's very important in, in Africa, in Mexico, in South America. Okay. Uh, Do you have that's, any... That's, that, those are, those are uh, places where you could spend $100 billion <laughs> very effectively and do a lot of good with it. But, for example, you're, you're, edu educate people uh, who could well, then come work well, on these. Well, problems. that's the question I'm asking you. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions that people need to get over? To, how can they be educated to get rid of misconceptions? In general, yeah. well, you suggested that they might have you know, uneducated fears or misplaced fears or nurtured, about aliens. or nurtured fears. Nurtured fears. Okay. Right. Right. Um, so don't they. Uh, they <laughs> Next in, in, question. In the, United, the United States, the United States has um, particular uh, uh, tolerance when it comes to freedom of the press. This and might, religion. And uh, religion. This, no, we're going to leave religion completely <laughs> out of this. Freedom of the press. Okay. Now, uh, dealing with this in a rational, dealing with freedom of the press in a rational way, so that the press can do its job, but not. Uh, overdo its job and generate and and impose itself on on the public is a very difficult issue and that brings us right back to the best of all worlds. Now some the people who are taking this course are students or other type of people uh, do you have any advice for them if some of them are thinking about becoming astrobiologists what would you what advice would you give them? Uh, think carefully about whether you want to be a scientist or not Science is, you've talked to a lot of scientists, right? Okay, yeah. I have an observation, right? I've, I'm a scientist and I've dealt with scientists my entire life. Scientists are intelligent people who compensate for their personality deficits through their work, right? <laughs> okay. okay. If you don't believe me, it, go, to, go to your it, faculty, it, take a look around that, and we'll continue the discussion. Is, isn't that everybody? <laughs> no, not necessarily. Really? The smart, the smart Artists ones. do not do that? <laughs> Dancers do I, not I, do I, that? I, they're not everybody. Okay. Right. <laughs> they're not everybody. Right. Garbage the, men do not the, do the, 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 the smart ones, the smart ones go out and get a job in the bank and, you know, come they have work short hours and earn a lot of money. And uh, the people... Oh, you are a German. The, the people are interested who are, you know, have this burning interest in their heart, burning curiosity mm -hmm. about uh, certain uh, scientific questions. Mm -hmm. they, be, they, have the, uh, they have one prerequisite for a scientific career, and I mean, they, you've really got to want to know because scientists work long hours and are paid poorly. And the reason that we work long hours and are paid poorly is because there are so many people who want to do our job. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you know, so you don't have to hire, you don't have to have a, a pay great salaries, right, to get people who want to work in science to enjoy this thing. So the, the poor pay and long hours have a name among academics, and it's called academic freedom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually the cost mm -hmm. for being able to, to do what you want to do. Science is a luxury that society affords itself, and it's a great honor uh, to, be, uh, to be a scientist because you, basically we are like artists in, um, in Europe in the 1800s were supported 
not by taxpayers, but by wealthy, okay? We, mm -hmm. the, 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 the artists in Europe were supported by the wealthy. Mm -hmm. We're supported by tax waivers, so mm -hmm. we're actually supported by the poor because the wealthy don't pay taxes mm -hmm. uh, to go out and do something useful for society. And that's a great honor. And all we have to do, and which I tell my students on a regular basis, all we have to do to hold up our part of the bargain is report on a regular basis about what we have done with taxpayers' money. And that means not hold a lecture, not do an interview. It means put it on paper in the written record. All right? We have to report in the written record what we have done. That's the way, scientists, uh, that's the way science has worked for thousands of years, and it works quite well. Now, I asked you, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? I thought you were going to say, as you said in the beginning, that answering the question, are we alone, is an intractable one, and therefore you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't, you shouldn't apply your curiosity in that direction. Well, that would be something that you could maybe, you know, leverage out of me if you had a long lever and a good fulcrum, but I wouldn't go that far because... Uh, yeah. My PhD advisor was named um, Heinz Sadler, and he gave me some very good advice. My undergraduate advisor was Rudiger Sorf. He also gave me some very good advice. Both came from Freiburg uh, and uh, in their academic career, and both were well versed in the philosophy of science, namely paying attention on a regular basis to what we're actually doing. And one of the things that uh, Heinz said to me, he says, as, as scientific advice, once you become a scientist, he said, never do what everybody else is doing for two reasons. Number one, it becomes a race to see who can do the obvious the fastest. Mm -hmm. That's not a good situation for anybody. Okay, it's already obvious what's going to happen, and then it just becomes a race to see who does it fastest. And that also is very conducive to scientific misconduct. Mm -hmm. Okay, you get their grants, you get their papers on your desk, and then suddenly, oh, we didn't know about that. No, that's very bad. The real, that's the first reason not to do it, but the real reason not to do it is that you don't have to do it. You'll be able to read about it. Somebody else will do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's already obvious what's to do, and so somebody else will do that. Do something that nobody else is doing, but make sure that it's interesting and that if you had to stand up in front of uh, your taxpayers and explain to them why you're investigating that, you would have a good answer. So that's some advice. Okay. And uh, are we alone? Probably not. You and I are not alone. We have 10 to the 14th microbes in our guts that are just always with us from day one to one of the life forms end. on earth alone in the universe you think almost certainly not